If you're at Luke chapter 2, say amen. amen. And it came to pass in those days, we all remember those days, that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world would be taxed. That makes you feel better, don't it? <laughs> it's not just an American thing. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed. Well, at least they fixed that part. They'll find that we just mail it in from here. Everyone into his own city. I'd have to be traveling to Cheyenne, Wyoming in April. I'm glad I don't have to do that. Yeah, what a revolting development that would be. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Very long way of saying she's about to have the baby. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The nativity scene. Got a neighbor that has a really nice one. That's right on the corner. We're, we're so thankful for it. We were glad to. Well, I'll just confess my uh, spousal sins here. We were on our way home Wednesday night. How many were here Wednesday night? And I, I normally don't eat before church. I don't want anything to hinder my ability to, to minister. And I was starving. And I couldn't wait to get home. To, I don't care if I had a peanut butter. I don't care if I had bread and butter. I'll tell you. And right before the corner, before we turned to get to my house, and my wife was driving, she said, let's go look at Christmas lights, and made a right-hand turn. And I'm like, now you know it wasn't calm in that car because you don't get between a man and his bread and butter. Now, she's my sweetheart, but I said, what are you doing? <laughs> I didn't handle the situation as pastorally as I'd like to confess. I was upset. Get me home, I'll make my own soup. And she said, and you have to understand that little whiny side, I said, man. So, because it was a beautiful moment to spend with my wife, I acquiesced. I understand what that word means. I gave in. I hung out with my wife. We looked at Christmas lights, but my stomach never stopped talking to me either. I had multiple conversations going on. Amen? So we looked at Christmas lights, and I'm thankful for all the different stuff, especially the nativity scene. You know, how many knows what the nativity scene, how many knows what nativity, nativity actually means? It literally means the process or circumstance of being born. <laughs> birth, especially in capitalized, uh, the birth of Jesus. That being said, if you, just, if you haven't already, lay your Bibles down. I want you to ask God to open your heart and open your mind, and we're going to send a prayer of Sister Peach's way, because that's a handful right there. Amen. Having babies ain't all pristine like the nativity scene likes to depict. Let's go before Lord Jesus. We love you. We need you. We ask for your guidance, your help, your unction, your anointing, your words anointed. I need your help today. I'm clay and dust. Let me to bring forth this word to strengthen, and encourage, and help all the hearers today, those here in the building and those online and those that will hear in the future. Lord, we thank you for your grace, your mercy. We're thankful that you robed yourself in flesh and came to save sinners. And everybody said in Jesus' name. 
God bless you, you can be seated. I could have listed numerous songs to fit right here, but one I couldn't get over, and it's the one titled, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. In fact, the lyrics go, it's the most wonderful time of the year with kids jingle belling and everyone telling you be of good cheer. Uh, I haven't gotten a whole lot of that. Been cutting line, eased out of my sequential spot, merging in traffic. Been told I was number one in that other way of saying it. Everyone telling you be of good cheer because it's the most wonderful time of the year. It's the ha happiest season of all. I like summer myself and spring, but you know, I digress. With, with those holiday greetings and gay happy meetings with friends come to call. Just let me know before you come in so I can pick up my socks and slippers or something, you know, let me. Hello, make sure I got something in the house because it's the hap happiest season of all. There'll be parties for hosting, marshmallows for toasting and caroling out in the snow. Oh, thank God that's not true. I'll take I'll carol in sunshine. And the sage words of an elder friend of mine, you don't have to shovel sunshine. That's right. <laughs> tales of the glories of Christmas is long, long ago. Can I be honest today with you? It's just us. Kids are gone. It's obvious there's been some story manipulating going on. They've cleaned Christmas up. They've sanitized and glamorized Christmas. <laughs> Just as there's no room at the end for Jesus, society has decided there's no room for pain in Christmas. Without saying a whole lot, I was greeted by this message this morning as I walked in and it may be the most wonderful time of year for some and it may be the happiest season of all but there's was pain met me when I walked into this room and I had to stop all the bustle of pastoring and preparing to preach to hold someone and pray with someone because they've prettied up Christmas but there's still pain here today Christmas is depicted with soft light, and picturesque details, angelic choirs, glowing stars, white streets with soft snow, wise men with great gifts. The story has been groomed, cleaned. Livestock and farm animals now peering reverently into a stall and the bright, clean yellow stall has been turned into a birthing room. A mother and father, raptured in joy, look reverently into a manger with a newborn babe and downy, sweet, smelling, soft, swaddling clothes. Christmas. Well, that's the clean version. <laughs> it's the Hallmark special version, the TV version. You know the one, the gentle, loving sound of silent night playing softly in the background, the perfect clean sheep on the hillside, and neatly dressed shepherds and brightly clothed wise men. It makes us warm. It blesses our heart, and it helps us segue into our version of Christmas. That comfortable, clean Christmas celebration without forcing us to see and feel for those in pain. So in essence, there's just no room in the end 
just like there's no room for pain in Christmas. That first day of the life of Jesus is in swaddling clothes. Sweet sounds of a cooing baby and the gentle laughter of a happy couple. It seems kind of to stand in stark contrast to the last day, the life of Christ, which is marked by dark clouds, stormy weather, graves breaking open, of bloody crosses and Roman guards. We have no problem dwelling on the pain of Calvary and the crucifixion. It's a scene fraught with blood, betrayal, cursing, suicide, whips and lies, thorns, spears, nails, hammers and torn flesh. We can plaster that right over Calvary. And... But pain at Christmas, Pastor, you're... you're throwing a bucket of cold water on my celebration. It doesn't fit our silent night version of the first Christmas. It infringes on our carefully guarded feelings. It arrests our delicate senses and motive as we, as we, we purchase and buy and spend and go about our Christmas business. So perhaps before next week rolls around and we celebrate the kid-friendly version with our little ones, which we will, don't miss it. Maybe us adults can for a few moments be real and look at the still holy night that Christ was born and removing the rose-colored glasses that we wear. All was not calm. And all was certainly not bright. No sterile hospital room could be found. No hotel, no motel. There was no price line. There were no orderlies, no nurses in clean white scrubs or even helpful family members giving aid or assistance. In fact, I'm kind of reminded of an old sarcastic response that's yelled to an inconsiderate family member who leaves the front door open. Were you born in a barn? Jesus could answer that in the affirmative. Yeah, I was. The Christ baby, the Messiah was born in a dirty, dusty, and at times, I'm sure Jesus wasn't the only one that needed a diaper genie in that hay-filled stable. Not to mention smell. Have you been in a barn lately? Have you ever been in a barn that smelled like Bath and Body Works at the mall? Or how about even baby powder or even desitin? So the environment wasn't perfect. It was not pristine. It was not sparkling clean. Honestly, by today's standards, it was unacceptable. But we gloss over that with our emotional Clorox and wipe it clean with decorations and warm hot drinks and fuzzy sweaters and parties. And honestly, we can accept that. We can handle that. The pain? Come on, Pastor, Christmas pain? Are, are you really going to do this to us? This, this year, I, I want to take pastoral privilege and, and not just be me as pastor, but as adults sitting in the room realizing that Christmas isn't sparkling clean. It's, it, it, it's, it's not fluffy and friendly. It's Have you actually... Been around a baby being born? I don't know about you. Most of you probably don't know this. I've delivered a child. I've delivered a baby. I, no, 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 I'm not kidding. I, I, forgive me for my, I was Johnny Bench. I played catch. I did the whole thing. I know what it is to deliver a child. I know the mess. I know that it's not pretty. The event in itself is, all, is beautiful, but in the birthing process. Can I say that 
it's extremely painful for individuals involved. Childbirth comes with sweat and strain and occasional screams and in sudden cases possibly swear words. My, my closest friend uh, had a child before me and I'll never forget, I revere him. Him and his wife are amazing. But right in the middle of that childbirth of this loving couple, she turned to gritters, he looked at him, you're never touching me again. That doesn't look like the nativity scene. And I'll digress that he said she also gave him a few unbelievable choice words. Pain does stuff to you. Paint it how you want it after the fact. But when you're in pain, it's not always sparkling clean. Mm -hmm. So inside this poorly lit barn, Mary faced with real pain and real childbirth, no running water, no latex gloves, probably some kind of ragtag bucket in a rag. And although Jesus was the immaculate conception, I highly doubt he was a pain-free reception. I'm skeptical that I don't believe Jesus was just a one-push delivery by any means. And I'm pretty sure I, I can say that I, I don't think that all pain was divinely absolved. As labor increased, I'm sure just like most of you precious ladies, she gritted her teeth. She labored in breathing. I don't think that she had a Lamaze class to help her to work through some of the helps and benefits of proper breathing. And so she labored with sweat beating her on her brow and running down her cheeks, varying cries of agony and a tightly set of clenched fists, maybe gasp and even sobs was probably the welcome that Jesus received. God robing himself in flesh to become one of us. And Mary and Joseph's eyes were the first to view. John 1 and 14 declares, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Can I tell you, it was bloody and messy because childbirth birth is all those things and more. And again, we don't mind the thought of pain on the cross, but we conveniently ignore the pain of Christmas. The complicated pregnancy. Joseph and Mary traveling was uneasy. They didn't just load up a car, a comfortable car ride to Bethlehem. There was no baby bag or Starbucks drive through to get a comfort drink on the way. Birthing Jesus hurt. Dealing with sin is painful. God's favor on these two wasn't play, placing before them a straight pathway of ease, but no, that favor brought pain. Emotional pain, physical strain, stress. It's undeniable as they had to duck and hide and travel. Why is it necessary today to take a different look at Christmas? Why is it necessary for me to help us remove the clean version of the nativity and lift that curtain to reveal the reality? Could we just continue to Clorox out the truth of the event to look like a children's play, complete with bathrobes, plastic baby Jesus doll that we do almost every year. Don't get me wrong. I love each and every one of you. You guys are amazing. And I want you to enjoy celebrating Christmas, the reason for the season of Jesus. And by all means, I want you to not turn from that. But can I talk for just a few minutes as we celebrate season, the Christmas, can, can I, can I talk about the pain that Christmas teaches? 
I want to be done before them next door. Trust me, I'm not going to keep you long, I hope. You have to understand that when even you and I are birthing God things in our life, pain should not be a surprise guest. It's going to be pain. He's ordering your steps and he's going to, there may be mountaintops, but there's still going to be valleys. There's going to be high moments and low moments. There's going to be great victorious moments and moments where you're in the thick of the battle. In other words, all things are not pain-free. Life is not pain-free. A good home doesn't come pain-free. Someone's rolling up their sleeves and, and bringing home the bacon. So someone, someone's getting up and cleaning and working and birthing and doing because great things don't come without pain and struggle and problems and pain. In fact, I found out that most good things take quite a bit of pain. Some blood, sweat, and tears. And I, I don't want anyone to miss how good we actually have it. Because some of you are facing some real pain right now. Some of you are facing some real pain today. You, 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 you may not be where you've tried to get financially. You, you may not be where you thought you'd be emotionally. Things may have not worked out and you're living for God and you're birthing the will of God, but there's still pain today and there'll be pain tomorrow and there was pain yesterday and you're, you're struggling and you'll come in and you'll worship God. But there's still pain. And our lives aren't that Clorox nativity scene that we want people to see when they walk in our home. Your life actually might just resemble the honest, unbleached version of the birth of Christ. There's some blood, there's some sweat, and a whole lot of tears. But I come to say, that's okay. Because if Jesus can come in pain and Mary and Joseph can survive the pain and the plan of God, then the pain that you face... God still knows about it, and he brought them through, and he'll bring you through. We're not going to deny the pain, but we will trust that God will lead us through the pain. And at the end of it all, just like childbirth, it's going to be beautiful in his time. We're going to trust that and keep on walking and keep on going. Yes, there's going to be pain, blood, sweat, and tears, but joy will come in the morning. I'm going to tell you that it's okay to not have a perfect Christmas. You don't have to have all the trappings that everybody says you got to have. They may not be in the pain you're in. They might be in a different chapter. <laughs> okay to be in the middle of a mess. Because you're birthing a new life right now. You're, you're birthing a new you right now. There's a change going on. And you stepped away and you stepped into some things. And yes, it's the plan of God. But don't think that it's painful, that it's not the will of God. It might just exactly be the favor of God. Just like it was for Mary. How is it when you find favor like Mary did and you find yourself unmarried and pregnant? Because what the world calls favor ain't what God calls favor. In fact, sometimes people are doing you no favor, telling you to try to take the easy way all the time. Hang in there. Just like Mary, God's got his hand on you. And he's got a hand on you, Joseph. He's got a hand. Hey, adults, he's got his hand on you and your family and your babies and your future. God doesn't leave us in the bad times. Oh, no, he's there closer than ever. God knows right where you're at. And I believe he wants me to tell you that it may not be sparkling clean, but it's going to be okay. <laughs> you don't understand that in all that pain and all that struggle and anguish, he might be hiding you from an enemy that would be worse. You may not be able to go about your plans as you thought and make your way back home. You may say, no, 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 let's get a message. Let's send him in. We're going to go around the long, oh, Lord God, I thought I'd be there by now. Well, I'm just keeping you from an enemy. 
I know it's painful. I know, I, I know it don't look like you thought it looked. Uh, I understand that. But our obedience to God's word and instructions doesn't mean we won't find ourselves face to face uh, with some agony, some strain, some bloody situations and some pain. It's not always rainbows and roses in the plan of God. <laughs> Birthing God things are almost always accompanied by pain because it separates those who can stick to the plan and those who can't. In fact, we should expect things to get messy because there's an always an enemy that wants to derail you. The Bible says in, in Matthew 2, and when they were coming to the house, they, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto them gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Oh, well, man, that's the will of God to get. You know what Christmas is about? What you're going to get? The greatest gift they got that day was not the gold, the frankincense, or the myrrh, no matter how financially righteous they were. The next one was the important one. And being warned of God in a dream <laughs> that they should not return to Herod, they departed in their own country another way. Even the wise men were blessed. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. Everybody's, <laughs> these are better gifts. In a dream saying, arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. Now, anybody remember those books as a kid where you could choose the direction you went? I, I, got, a, I got a commercial I could put right here if you want it. No? We don't hear of Herod's slaughter during Christmas, but it is part of the story. So if we had newspapers, newscast back then, I digress. The Jerusalem Gazette titled headlines, thousands of children murdered. The Gazette has learned through informed sources that before dawn today, <laughs> soldiers of Herod's army began the massacre of thousands of small baby boys. The murders have been literally from house to house. All the children killed are young. In fact, all the baby boys were two years old and younger. This is the headline, folks. In an attempt to find out what is behind this unprecedented horror, we have sent out our intrepid reporter, to ask Herod some questions. The intrepid reporter is on TV now. Earlier this morning, Herod's press secretary read a statement from the king. It stated that recently there had been a formal request to see the king from a group of magi. These wise men had journeyed from the east for approximately 18 months in search of the king of the Jews. Their claim was that they were stranger, astrologers and were following a star that reportedly was leading them to the king of the Jews. Herod seemed to take interest, and he took them serious. And these were unknown magi from a group, and he said that the magi claimed to have brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. As Herod met with these magi and requested that when they found the new king, that they were to inform him so that he could too worship him. But we've just received word from inside the palace. An unidentified source informed us that Herod was actually livid. Behind closed doors, after the Magi left, he went into a tirade. Herod was reported to have stated that no one would take his kingdom from him, that he had spent years developing in conjuncture with Rome, and he was the rightful king of the Jews. He had Caesar's guarantee. Our source also informs us that there was a heated family argument on how to handle the recent threat to Herod's throne. Antipas, Philip, 
Herodias all put forth different ideas, and after a long acrimonious debate, it seems Archelaus won out. It was he that put forth the simple yet unbelievable solution. Reports state that he slowly said, there is one sure way to rid us of this threat. All eyes centered on Archelaus. He took a deep breath and said, just slay all the male children under two years of age. Our sources say it was as if the air left the room. The enormity of the idea was nauseating. Even the ruthless Herod was speechless. All eyes were on the floor. For what seemed like many minutes, no one said anything. Herod stood, left the room. But as reported just before dawn this morning, the soldiers of Herod's army began to massacre and to eliminate any future king of the Jews. And our latest news reports that somewhere around 10,000 young children have been murdered. We don't talk about this at Christmas because it's not pretty. But the enemy's still trying to kill. Your new, new, your new birth has an enemy. Your new birth, just like the birth of Christ, has an enemy. Your new life of living for God will have pitfalls and enemies. In fact, uh, 1 Peter tells us in, in chapter 5, verses 8 through 11, be sober. Hey, folks, this is not a time to party. This is time to be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Sounds like a, a, a Herodias plan. Whom stead, resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered. Look, everybody say pain. pain. A little while. Make you perfect. Establish. Strengthen. Settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It is throughout the word of God that we find the ugly side of life. And like Christmas, it's really not bleached clean. When Gideon did the will of God, it turned the whole town against him. When, when Joseph shared his dream, it brought pain and he got sold as a slave. When the three Hebrews stood up against the evil tide of society, they found themselves in trouble. And I could go on, but I want to say this Christmas, don't. Don't be so quick to think you're, you have to settle for a bleached out, downy soft version. In that nativity scene of your life, God's birthing something. There may be pain. There may be blood. There may be some agony in your life. In fact, the farm animals of your life may not be lined up and groomed and clean like they just left. <laughs> the vets, they're not standing still reverently looking and beholding your life or even remotely interested in your life. But your miracle's still coming. The straw in your life may not be pristine and yellow and smelling clean, but there's still a plan for your life. There may not be wise men that show up your door and bring you gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but I promise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords still has a plan for your life. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hey, you have to understand, you may never be handed gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but if you're willing to endure the pain, face the blood, sweat, and tears, the unpleasantness of the birth that God is bringing in your life, God has an amazing plan for you. Jeremiah 29, 11 re reiterates, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Can I tell you, it's not all about the start, but it's about the finish. Oh, the psalmist articulated it well in reference to enemies. He said, when I cry unto thee, then shall my enemies turn back. I know this. I know for God 
is for me. Can you say that today? Christmas is about knowing God is for me. That's why he robed himself in flesh and came and walked the dirty streets of because he's for us. Christmas is about a God that's for us. And in all honesty, I actually think one of our greatest struggles in life is, is expectation. When it don't look like the picture we created in our... I didn't think this is where I'd be. Or this is not what I expected. I had better plans. I, I thought I'd done enough. To... And so maybe your nativity isn't as picturesque <laughs> as a Christmas card. You may not have the life that they want to make a Hallmark movie out of. <laughs> there just might not be a giant star shining above your head. Uh, angels may not be singing angelic tones that we can suddenly hear around your presence. Shepherds may not declare how amazing you are. And instead, like, Mary and Joseph, uh, all hell might be breaking loose uh, as God is moving you into a plan that the enemy don't understand, that the enemy don't recognize. Uh, and out of nowhere, it may not have been silent night, <laughs> but the answer still comes for you. <laughs> and that need will appear and the answers to your questions may be found. So often we overlook what people go through. And I hope that Christmas can be the most wonderful time of year for you. But if you're the one in pain, if you're in the middle of a painful push, Remember that there is just as much purpose in the pain of Christmas as there was at Calvary. Did you hear what I said? Christmas is really about the dirty job of defeating sin. Matthew chapter 1 says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And here's the reason why. For he shall save his people from their sins. Oh, thank God. I'm telling you, Christmas was never meant to be sparkling. It was never meant to be commercialized. It was never meant to be depicted a nativity scene of perfection. It was meant to be bloody. It was meant to defeat and go to war with sin because it goes on to say now when all this was done oh, oh, all that you're going through all that you've been doing all that, that warfare that you're fighting that being fat, all this was done all this was done because God wants to defeat the sin in your life that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us it wasn't lost on the prophet Isaiah as he foretold in Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, the Prince of Peace was born in anything but peace, but he was made for your peace. Hurting and running and hiding from a murderous Herod while thousands of baby boys are killed. 
I don't know how they did it, but they kind of tried to pretty that storyline up. Doesn't go as well with eggnog Christmas trees in your mom's homemade apple pie, does it? Let me remind you, even with all the painful truth in the birth of Christ, God had a plan. Amen. It was foretold. It was set in motion long ago. God always had a plan. God always has a plan. Even with the pain. God has a plan for your life. Look at your neighbor and say, God has a plan for your life. Now say this one. Now are you ready for this one? God has a plan for your pain. You see, just like Mary and Joseph, something great is being birthed in your life. And God is dealing with that old enemy, sin. <laughs> in John, 1 John 2 and 2, and he is the propitiation, the appeasement for our sins. And not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. God had a plan. 1 John 1 and 7 says, but if we walk in the light, this is going to mean something. As he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We may not walk pain free, but we're walking in the light. Hello? <laughs> we're not walking in darkness. There may be pain, but I can see. There may be problems, but I can see what's going on. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. But it is with my prayer that each and every one of you will learn the most important lesson of Christmas. It's actually found in the book of Acts. It's the book where the church was born. Where all this is important to God. In Acts 20 and verse 35, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring. Anybody have a child without labor? See, you're birthing something in your labor, folks. You ought to support the weak. To remember the words that he's listened to. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is my prayer that every one of us remember the words of Jesus. Christmas is not about receiving. It's truly about giving. As we stand, go ahead and smile. Come on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that 1120? Come on, someone smile. Come on, man. It ain't quarter, it ain't quarter to 12. Come on, Carol. Give me a smile. Somebody. I did it. <laughs> it's sparkling clean up in here today. Well, we'll just see how the rest of this goes. I want to close with a poem. It's an old one, but I've just recently heard it. The old man was fumbling around one day in a woman's clothing store. He found his wife a Christmas coat, and he was heading for the door. When he bumped into a little boy that looked like he was lost, he said, Mr. Can you help me find out how much something costs? Here it is almost Christmas, and the nights are getting cold. Winter time is upon us, and my mom don't have a coat. I've been working for the neighbors and saving for a time, and in his tiny outstretched hand was a dollar and a dime. His gaze went from the big-eyed boy to that pretty Christmas coat, and he finally cleared away the lump that was in his throat. He said, son, that's just what this coast costs. We're lucky that we found her. And he turned around and gave a wink to the lady at the counter. She put it in a pretty box and wrapped it up just so and went off into the back 
and found a big red Christmas bow. He said, I thank you for the help, sir. And I kindly thank you, ma'am. I hope you all are going to have a great big Christmas, because I know I am. Well, the old man walked home busted, except for the dollar and the dime, thinking he'd just have to buy the coat another time. He told his wife that Christmas this year wouldn't be much fun, and he gently took her in her arms and told her what he'd done. She said, why, you old softy, I wouldn't trade you for a farm. I've got two or three old coats and your love to keep me warm. She put that money in a matchbox and placed it beneath their tree and said, this is the grandest gift you've ever given me. The years went by like years will do when people are in love. Their marriage was a golden bond that was forged by God above. Then one day came some bitter news that filled his heart with fright. The doctor told him, the old man's wife, that she was going to lose her sight. He said, there's an option we can do, but it puts me on the spot because it's quite a complex procedure and it's going to cost a lot. The old man said, doctor, I'm a failure. I've made no preparation. We don't have the money for that kind of operation. Then the doctor got the strangest look and he sat there for a while. And then he slowly nodded and he broke out in a smile. He said, why, sir, you can't fool me. You're a very wealthy man, a long ago investment in the world's best saving plan. I'll see she gets the best of care. She's going to be just fine. And the total cost to you, my old friend, is a dollar and a dime. The old man stared in disbelief. Then he recognized the smile, the one he'd seen those years ago in a loving, thoughtful child. He said, what you've given me that day was more than just a coat. You gave me the gift of giving and you gave my mother hope. My mother had been mistreated, neglected and abused. But she gave life just one more chance, and it was all because of you. Now every year she takes that coat and lays it beneath our tree. It represents to, to us the things that Christmas ought to be. She says that when we leave this world for a better home someday, the only things we'll take with us are the things we gave away. You know, God is not afraid of the messes and the uncleanness. You may be here with pain and problems, wounds and hurts, and you may not quite clean up like today's Christmas nativity, but I'm here to tell you, I know a God who can clean it up. He robed himself in flesh and was brutalized, beaten, betrayed, and painfully bled. But his pain is what does the real cleaning that we need today at Christmas.